conservation and momentum. And so we reached, we reached the Cauchy equation. acceleration equal forces on the right hand side and we separate it into body forces and surface forces. And then we use the Cossidic equation for a Newtonian fluid, right, to, uh, to work on that stress tau. So in static conditions at rest, you only have normal components and so we wrote that tau as minus p proportional to the chronic adapter. And then in the moving fluid we added that tensor called the degradatory stress tensor, sigma ij, which is related to the velocity gradient tensor, which has two components. Okay, we'll see that today again. One is symmetric and the other one is anti-symmetric. And um, so we have the strain rate tensor, E, and the rotational tensor. But the rotational tensor doesn't accelerate the flow. So only the uh, strain rate tensor is left. Then we did a few hypotheses and assumptions. We, we went fast in this because it's not particularly interesting how you reach the result, but you go from 81, uh, what is it? You go from 81 components of that for the other tens of kappa down to uh, one, okay? So that tens of tau is a static component or a normal component minus P chronic delta plus the uh, deviatoric stack tensor sigma. And by using the uh, consider equation for internal fluid, we reach that conclusion. But, okay, all those terms. And you have those two terms with the viscosity movement. Okay, so if you plug that in into the uh, Cauchy equation, the uh, expression derived from the consider equation, which is that one. Okay you reach the general case for the Navier-Stokes equation, which is something like this. Mass times acceleration equal the body forces plus the surface forces that has a normal component, the pressure gradient, and these viscous components. Okay. Uh, so for an incompressible fluid, the divergence of the fluid is equal to zero. And so that expression can be simplified to this one. Okay? So this is the Navier-Stokes equation for an incompressible fluid. The acceleration of the flow is equal to the forces on the right hand side. You have body forces, you have the pressure gradient, and you have viscous terms, which are the tangential forces. Okay? If you eliminate the viscous effects, so all the uh, terms with the viscosity, then you're left with the Euler equation, which is simply mass times acceleration equal body forces and the pressure limit. This is what we're not going to do, which is nice. It's a nice power. Okay. So. You want the light on or off? The, the light, without the light, the video is very horrible. So I should leave the lights on? Yeah. They're on. No, there's like an extra light. There's an extra light? Yeah. No, there's three yeah. bottom. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> Middle. Okay. Front. Where's this? Okay. This one. Nothing. Yeah. Okay, so today we're going to do the uh, conservation of energy. So we're going to derive the uh, mechanical energy equation. You need to get out. Yes. Soon, please. Okay, so we're going to do the uh, mechanical energy equation. So. Uh, what we're going to work with is both the kinetic energy and the potential energy. 
Okay, potential energy, we all know this, potential energy is MGH. At the end of the class, I'm going to show you a very nice movie. Uh, potential energy is MGH or rho GH or rho GZ. Right? And the kinetic energy is half of mass uh, u squared. Okay, so an equation for the conservation of mechanical energy will be, <coughs> again as usual, a rate of change in fluids. Okay? So a rate of change in the mechanical energy, which is kinetic plus potential energy, that is going to be equal to the rate of change in energy, so the d by t, plus any rate of work that is done by forces, add the non-subtracting energy, minus rate of viscous dissipations. Okay? So this is what we are going to uh, derive. So, we're going to derive the mechanical energy equation in, in three or four different ways, okay, and slightly different expressions, they all mean the same thing, but by deriving the mechanical energy equation in different ways, different terms will pop up, and it's going to be uh, useful to see these terms, how they relate to each other. So the first way we're going to derive the mechanical energy equation, or the kinetic energy, or the kinetic energy equation, okay, is by the scalar product of the momentum equation. So we're going to take the Cauchy equation. We're going to do the scalar product of the Cauchy equation and the velocity. Okay. So we're going to take the Cauchy equation and do the scalar product with the velocity. Okay. So we have the Cauchy equation. Body forces that I'm going to write already as G plus Okay, so this is my Cauchy equation. I'm just going to do the uh, X component. So in the X component, what do we have? We have D by T. Equal one over rho one j one because we know that i j uh, i is equal to zero. Right? G has only one component in the uh, k direction. So this is the. Uh, X component of the Cauchy equation. Now we're going to do the scalar product with the velocity vector. So this is going to be our first we Now remember that, so we're going to have, now we're going to do the scalar product of the velocity vector with the uh, Cauchy equation, so there's going to be a u, e value of u, and so on and so forth. So we can write u, e value t, as e value t of half of u squared, okay? Okay. 
So now if we do this color product with the velocity vector in the x component, what do we get? We get this u d by dt of u, which we're going to write as this. this plus u by dx this plus v d by d of squared okay. and this is going to be equal to u over all and whatever it is inside the practices. And you do the same thing for V component. Equal row G equals 
also on the other side again. I, I plus I. Okay, so this is the first expression for a mechanical energy equation where you recognize already a the Lagrangian derivative. You recognize the term here that is going to be the kinetic energy, and this is going to be potential energy. Now, to, uh, to express this as potential energy, we're going to write the body force as a gradient of a scalar potential. Okay? So this is going to be a potential, and I'm going to write it as PGZ. So that my G is going to be minus graph 5. Okay. Lost the best part. Okay. So I write the body force as a gradient of a scalar potential, and I define the scalar potential. Well, I define the potential like this. So now I define the body force as the gradient of this. Uh, scalar potential. So there I have a UI GI, right? And I can write that as minus UI in XI of GC. Which is equal to minus the Lagrangian derivative of G Okay, so this will be the gradient of my scalar potential. And this is true because the Lagrangian derivative has only one component, right? The d by dt of gravitation is equal to zero, the d by dx is equal to zero, the d by dy is equal to zero. You're only left with if you write this, it is going to be d by dt plus u dx plus v and the values d by z of g. This is equal to zero. So you are left uh, there's a minus minus GZ. Which is what we had at the beginning. Okay. So defining my body force as the gradient of scalar potential takes me back to the uh, original results. So I can go back to this first expression and write this as the kinetic energy. Then this is UIGI UIGI is this, right? It's a minus, I take it on the, left, on the left hand side, so there's a plus, the Lagrangian derivative of GZ. Right? Sorry? So we are, we are taking this. And we are replacing it with the Lagrangian derivative. Okay. 
so this density, this density here as well. This is minus Lagrangian derivative of Gz, so plus Lagrangian derivative of Gz. Okay, so here I'm saying that the rate of change or the rate of increase of kinetic energy equal the sum of the rate of work done by body forces, which is here, and the rate of work done by the net surface forces. This one. Okay. So the rate of change in kinetic energy is equal to the rate of work done by the body forces plus the rate of work done by the uh, surface forces. But now we want to look at this term. Okay. We are here. Okay. So the rate of increase in kinetic energy equals the sum of the rate of work done by the surface force second term on the right hand side and there is the work done by the body force the first term on the right hand side okay. so this term is the rate of work done by the surface force okay. and it's telling me that is given the velocity times the force on or the stress on the element of fluid. Right? But this is not the total rate of work done by the stresses on the element of fluid. Okay? Because there's another component which is deforming the fluid without uh, without accelerating the fluid. Okay. So you could deform the fluid by compression or expansion, we will see later. And you're not accelerating the fluid, but you're changing the energy of the fluid. Okay. So you could add uh, internal energy or change the internal energy without accelerating the fluid. So the total surface forces, so the total rate of work done by the surface forces is not this. That's just the component that accelerates the fluid and changes, for example, the kinetic energy. But there's another component of the uh, surface force that doesn't accelerate the fluid, so it doesn't change the kinetic energy, but it changes some other form of energy, for example, internal energy. So the total rate of work done by the surface forces is actually this. Okay. And this has two components. That one. Okay. Which is velocity times uh, the forces on the element of fluid. And that accelerates the fluid. That changes the kinetic energy. Plus this. This other component doesn't accelerate the fluid, but actually deforms the fluid. So this is the total work. And this is a rate, again, so rate of total work per unit volume. This uh, increases or changes the kinetic energy. And this deforms. So this is the formation work. Okay, so that expression only says that change in kinetic energy is due to this term that is changing the kinetic energy, so accelerating the flow. But the, the total rate of work done by the surface forces also has another component which deforms the fluid without accelerating. So it can deform the element and, for example, change its internal energy. 
Now, if you remember, uh, what is the product of a symmetric tensor and an anti-symmetric tensor? Uh, symmetric tensor times an anti-symmetric tensor gives zero. zero. Right? And the stress tensor is symmetric. In this one, we're looking at the forces on an element fluid. Okay? So the stress tensor is symmetric. And the symmetric tensor times an anti symmetric tensor is equal to zero. Do you remember what this is? Velocity gradient. Velocity gradient tensor. And the velocity gradient tensor is given by, can be separated into two tensors. Symmetric and anti-symmetric. And what is the symmetric? EJ plus the rotation of this. So you have plus half of the rotation of this. So you have a symmetric part and an anti-symmetric part. So this is symmetric. And this has two components, symmetric and anti-symmetric. The symmetric times the anti-symmetric is equal to zero. So this means that tau ij times the velocity gradient tensor is equal to eij so my equation for the conservation of mechanical energy can be written as So the total, okay. I only had this component, right? the, one, the one that increases the kinetic energy, not the deformation one. So I rewrite this term as the total minus the deformation. So the total minus the deformation. But the deformation work is equal to this. So now I have a term that is giving me the total rate of work done by the surface forces minus the one that doesn't accelerate the flow, doesn't give a change in kinetic energy, but gives a different uh, contribution to the conservation of energy, which is, for example, compression and expansion. Now we're going to substitute the constitutive equation for its own fluid there. Sorry, I, with, missed, I, I missed the way it's negative. You missed what? I missed to follow you. Why it's minus? Why it is minus? Mm -hmm. Because the total rate of work by the surface forces, okay, which is this term, okay, term A, this is term B, and this is term C. The total rate of work done by the surface forces A, is equal to a term that accelerates the flow, so it increases the kinetic energy, plus a term that is not changing the kinetic energy, but is also is only deforming the element of fluid. So it changes the energy, but not the kinetic energy. It's not accelerating the flow. So I rewrite B as A max. And now we're going to use the constitutive equation for an internal fluid that I'm sure you remember by heart. Right? Well, the first term is easy. Yes. OK, first term um, for a fluid at rest, minus P crank of delta, plus we use the, uh, the general case not for the compressible fluid. So now we're going to substitute this consider equation for internal fluid into the uh, deformation term. Okay, so 
this dot is equal to minus p j plus two j dot j minus two third of viscosity of the flow. You know the properties of the Kronecker delta. So this is equal to this. EII. Which is equal to EII is the diagonal terms of the tensor. Right? And the diagonal terms, the diagonal terms are going to be in the regions d by x of u plus d by y of v plus so one point nine. P is pressure. Hmm? P that I mean P is pressure, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, those are the diagonal terms. D by x of u plus d by y of v. So that's the divergence of so this is equal to minus p divergence of u plus two. No. J j j minus two third of g squared. And now we're going to stop here and call these two terms that have the viscosity, we're going to call it viscous terms. Some phi. Okay? So we're going to group them together into a term that we're going to call it phi. So those are going to be the viscous terms. That is related to the tangential forces. So we were working on this equation and this term in particular, and we plug in the constitutive equation. So now we can rewrite that equation as Grange derivative of the kinetic energy. We're going to take the uh, potential energy back on the uh, right hand side. Plus okay. term A, the total weight of work. By the surface forces, and then this. Okay, I just moved this term back on the right hand side. Now I can substitute with the constitutive equation, and so this is going to be all this term here. Okay, minus and minus that plus. Okay. And then there was a minus, so minus some viscous terms. So this is going to be the end for now. This is going to be my energy. Okay. And what I have here. Here I'm saying that the rate of change in my kinetic energy is equal to the rate of work done by whom? Body forces. Plus plus this. Plus 
what's the total total rate of work by the surface forces or the stress start by stress start. Okay, that's the total rate of work, not just the one that accelerates the flow. And then I have these two other terms that do not accelerate the flow, do not change the kinetic energy, but actually are the rate of work by volume, uh, this is, uh, there's a plus, so expansion, okay, so if I expand or compress the volume, and then the rate of viscous dissipation. Okay, so these are the two deformation terms, and this is the one that accelerates the flow. Sorry, this is sorry. This is the total. Okay, this is the total rate of work by the stresses, and these are the two that deform the element of fluid. How can you deform it? You can deform it by volume expansion or contraction, or viscous dissipation. Okay, so you can change the energy that way. Okay, so the total rate of work done by surface forces of the element fluid has two components, one that increases the kinetic energy, the other one that just deforms the element of fluid, so that's just deformation work. And so the deformation work, so that term C, okay, has the strain of tensor, so you plug that in into here, okay. you use the Newtonian constitutive equation, you substitute, and then you plug back into the uh, energy equation. Da -da. The viscous terms, and once you plug it in, this is what you get. Okay. So this is a form of the mechanical energy. Rate of change of kinetic energy is equal to the rate of work done by body forces plus the total rate of work done by the surface stresses plus the rate of work done by volume expansion or contraction minus okay, viscous dissipation. Dissipation is also is only is always a sink of energy dissipation, so that's why there's minus. Okay? You seem bored. Okay. Okay? <laughs> yes? Okay. That means yes? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> if you want to don't do the uh, derivations, I just give you the expression of energy equations and... Uh, I'm saying okay so that because nobody's talking down I say okay, <laughs> we are following you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so now we're going to derive two more times the mechanical energy equation because you like it so much. Okay, and we're going to see different terms that pop out when we derive the mechanical energy equation. So another way of deriving the mechanical energy equation is, is in a way that eventually you get what is the uh, divergence of the kinetic energy flux. Okay? So if you then integrate over a volume, how does the energy changes over that volume? So we've seen it before through the uh, Stokes theorem, um, Gauss theorem. The integral over a volume is equal to the flux through the area uh, bounding the volume. Okay? So the divergence of the energy 
um, integrated over the area of the elemental fluid will give you the change in energy inside of the elemental fluid. So now we're going to take the, uh, we're going to start from a different approach. We're going to take the continuity equation, e over by t plus. Okay, we're going to take the uh, continuity equation, and we're going to multiply this by this, which is going to be the kinetic energy term. Uh, and then you remember the other expression that we had, which was the Grangian derivative of y equal rho i i plus the term giving you the acceleration. Okay, that was the first expression that we derived. So we can rewrite this as squared plus okay. So now we're going to add this expression to that expression. So we get this e by t plus this dxj. Okay. Plus the rule d by dt of this. Because we want to reach uh, the uh, solution that we like. Okay. So we just so we take the continuity equation, we multiply by the term that is the kinetic energy, that is equal to zero, and then we take the first expression of the metallic energy equation. So we add the two left hand left hand side terms equals to the two right hand side terms. Okay. In this case is zero, so the right hand side here is just going to be this. So now I can take this term and, and this term, the two time derivatives, and get them together. 
Okay, so d by dt of half rho dy squared. Yes. Plus the other two terms. So the d by the xj. And uh, half of rho uj ui squared. And this is equal to the right hand side. Okay. So now define a kinetic energy per unit volume. Okay, so this this was my kinetic energy, this is my kinetic energy per unit volume. So I define this to be D. So that's going to be my kinetic energy per unit volume. So this is going to be d by dt of E plus the divergence of U Okay. This was my of energy plus the divergence of the energy times the velocity vector so this is a flux change the energy over my volume of integration, that is going to change the energy in time plus the divergence of the flux. Okay, so imagine there is no imagine there is no sources of sinks of energy, so the right hand side is equal to zero. You just have d by d of e plus the divergence of the flux of energy. That is equal to zero. Okay. So energy will increase, for example, if the divergence is negative. Okay? If you take this on the other side, it's minus. So the, diverg the energy will increase if the divergence is negative. So if there is a convergence of energy. Over which you are 
uh, looking at the energy. If there is a convergence, so there's an energy flux entering through the boundaries, then the energy will increase. Imagine there are no sources of sinks of energy. Hmm? If there's a so if this is the volume of this is the um, the uh, material volume, for example, or fixed volume over which we are doing the energy uh, conservation. Okay, there are no sources of sinks of energy. Okay, no no compression, no viscous dissipation, no no um, surface stresses accelerating the flow and so increasing the kinetic energy. Uh, no body forces, imagine no body forces changing the energy over this uh, fixed volume. So the only way that energy can change is if there is a flux of energy entering through the boundaries of the volume. Yes. So if you have convergence, then energy will increase. If you have divergence, then energy will increase. So if there's a flux of energy out of this room, energy will decrease. There's a convergence of energy into this room, the energy will increase. Yes? Uh, uh, I'm not clear with how kinetic energy flux, right? Flux, yes. Yeah. The verges of the kinetic energy flux. So we have defined this as the um, kinetic energy per unit volume. Yes, I'm and not... Uh, I'm and it's a flux because it's energy times the velocity vector. So this is a flux of energy. Okay? And this is the divergence. So if this is equal to zero, if this term changes, this will have to change the opposite way. So if you have divergence, so you have an energy flux, you have divergence of the energy flux, so there is energy fluxed out of this room, then the ability of the energy will decrease. Energy will decrease in time because you are fluxing energy out of this room. If you have convergence, so this is a minus, if you have convergence of the energy flux, so you have some energy flux into the volume, this is a minus, you put it on the other side, this is plus, so the value of E will increase. Did you see the difference before? No, it made sense now. Yeah. Convergence, convergence is negative of divergence. So negative of yeah. plus. Uh, 
this plus the divergence of the line flux. This is going to be equal to the right hand side of the second expression. Okay, just using the left hand side of y expression and the right hand side of the other. Yeah. Is that the other input of them? Hmm? No. This is the conservation of energy. So it, it, it's just two different ways of, of expressing the conservation of energy. So I'm just taking the left hand side of the first expression and equating that to the right hand side of the second expression. They have to be the same. Okay, so this is my flux divergence. And that is equal to any sources or sinks of energy on the right hand side. Uh, now we're going to integrate this over a fixed volume, but it's easier. And is there somebody singing? <laughs> was there somebody singing or was it in my head? <laughs> I, I could hear one. So, um, if we're doing a volume integral over a fixed volume, okay, and we're doing the volume integral of this divergence of a flux, I can use a uh, theorem to get rid of the divergence. What am I going to do? So this is going to be the volume integral of the uh, divergence of the flux of energy. And I can write that as, to get rid of the divergence of the flux, I can use the Gauss theorem. Gauss theorem. And so the volume integral is going to become a surface so integral of what? And uh, if I do the same thing here, the volume integral of this divergence is going to be equal to the yeah, surface integral of the I dij. And there's a reason why I don't want every term as a volume integral. So the volume integral of this, the d by dt of, it's a fixed volume. So if you remember the Leibniz theorem, I can take the uh, time derivative outside. You do remember the Leibniz theorem. For a fixed volume, this is equal to the volume integral of the time derivative. There's no other extra term because the, the boundaries over which I'm integrating are not. So I have this first term, and this is going to be the rate of change of my kinetic energy being in volume. Okay, that's the first term. Then I have a second term, which is this one. Okay, the error integral of the UDA. And this is the rate of outflow, okay, it's a flux, across the boundaries. Okay, we used we use Gauss to go from a volume integral of the divergence to an area integral of the flux. So we went from the volume integral of the divergence equal the flux through the boundaries. So this is the rate of change of the kinetic energy plus the rate of outflow of energy across the boundaries. The area is the area bounding the volume. That's why I wanted an area integral and not a volume integral. 
So I can express the change in kinetic energy as the flux out of the boundaries over which I am integrating. And that is equal to the volume integral of rho g mu. Okay. And this is the rate of work. done by by forces then I have the second term on the right hand side again we went from a volume integral to an area integral because that is going to be This is the rate of work by the surface forces again at the boundaries. Okay, that's why I wanted an error integral and not a bound and not a volume integral because I want to express this as the rate of work done by the surface forces on the boundaries over which I'm integrating. Okay. Consider the element of fluid over which we're doing the, uh, the conservation of energy, right? So I'm integrating over that volume. So the total rate of change of the kinetic energy inside that volume plus the rate of outflow of energy across the boundaries of the volume, okay? The energy flux that is leaving the volume or entering the volume. That is going to be equal to the rate of work done by the body forces on the entire volume. That's why I want a volume integral. Plus an air integral of the rate of work done by the surface forces on the element of fluid. That's why I want an air integral. Okay? To express the rate of work done by the surface forces that are accelerating the fluid. Sorry, that's the total, the, the total rate of work. And then I have two more volume integrals and I want them to be volume integrals of this, which is again rate of work, rate of work done by volume expansion. Okay. Pressure is expanding or compressing the volume over which I'm looking at the energy. Okay. So that has to be a volume integral minus the volume integral of so this is going to be the rate of viscous dissipation okay so basically we did for the third time the same thing just visualizing the conservation of energy over a volume in this case, the fixed volume. Okay. We took the first expression, and then we took the second expression, where we have the divergence of the flux of energy. Okay. And so we combine the two to get three. And then we integrated that over a fixed volume. And we looked at the conservation of energy over that fixed volume. So the rate of change of the kinetic energy plus the rate of outflow across the boundaries, energy leaving or entering the volume. That is equal to the volume integral of the rate of work done by the body forces, plus the rate of work done by the surface forces at the boundaries of the volume over which I'm integrating, plus the volume integral of the rate of work done by volume expansion or contraction, minus the rate of viscous dissipation over the entire volume. I'll stop here because I, I, I see that you need to see the end. Well, I'll leave this expression here, of course. I think that's very nice. Huh? 
There's never an end. It's, it's the third time that we reach a, the same conclusion. Oh. Right? So first we reach this conclusion. Rate of change of kinetic energy is equal to the uh, rate of work done by the body forces. The total rate of work by the surface forces and then those that deform the element of fluid, compression and expansion and viscous dissipation. We derive this in a different way to reach this expression. So the rate of change of the energy plus the divergence of the kinetic plus the divergence of the energy flux is equal again to the same thing. I took this and this and I integrated this over a volume, a fixed volume, to get a budget over a volume over which I'm integrating. And so I get all these different terms that tell me how energy changes within a volume over which I'm integrating. Okay? So you see all the different terms that change the energy over a fixed volume, which is beautiful. Uh, okay, yes. So I'll do it. Maybe this is not the end. We have 15 more minutes. So I can derive the same thing again for the fourth time and reach the thermal equation. No, I'll do it next time. Uh, well, you can read the slides. Huh? You have the slides since an hour. Okay, you sent it? Thank you. Yeah. You can read the slides, it's the same thing. And now we can. Now we can watch a demonstration of the conservation of energy. Maybe.